for a chat. Okay. Is there a chat window? Where's the chat window on this? There is a chat window. Oh, you, if you move your mouse when you click, uh, yep, if, when you move your mouse, there should be a chat window off to the side. So everybody, I'm going to ask you stay on mute if you aren't talking. Um, it just helps with the background noise and keeps things quiet. Um, I will be, if you do have questions at any time throughout, go ahead and write it in the chat window. I'll be collecting those. If Dr. Alex sees them along the way, he'll answer them. If not, we'll collect them and we'll review them at the end and we'll make sure we don't miss any. So make sure if you have a question, you can put it into the chat window. Um, I'd like to start out by saying welcome everybody to a, the DiVentures series of expert talks. I've been looking forward to this one tonight. So thank you all for joining because this one's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, I'm gonna start out by introducing you to uh, Pat, our very own Pat Perkheiser an instructor for us at DiVentures, and he's going to start by uh, kind of telling us what we're talking about tonight. So, Pat, and then um, Dr. Alex, you can take over screen, uh, screen share. Yep. Well, thank you for letting me uh, introduce Alex. I've known him for quite a while, and I'm very proud to introduce him. But Dr. Antonio started his shark conservation path back in 94. He was the director of field operations the Shark Research Institute. He was based in Princeton, New Jersey at the time. Currently, he's moved on. He's working as the volunteer CEO for Fins Attached, which was founded in 2010. Um, I'm proud to say I've been with him since then. He's had a passion for shark research and conservation for over 25 years. His work's taken him to most of the Caribbean, Honduras, Baja, California, Galapagos, Costa Rica, Malpelo, and of course, Guadalupe Island. 1999, he convinced the Honduran government to protect whale sharks. They started a, a program and he was featured in a Discovery Channel documentary called Future Shark. In 2016, Alex convinced, there's some examples of some of the little things that people can do, but Dr. Antonio convinced a, gro a grocery store chain headquarters in Colorado to remove all products containing shark ingredients. The store was National Groceries, or Grocers, and in March of 2017, a physician statement was submitted by or to NOAA Fisheries to lobby for the oceanic white tip sharks to be placed on the U.S. endangered species list. Um, which ultimately did occur. Alex is um, probably his greatest accomplishment was the 2017 acquisition of the 134 foot long range research expedition vessel. And it was named the Sharkwater. And it was named in honor of the work started by Rob Stewart, producer of Sharkwater documentary and the Sharkwater is mainly turning out to be a host to many different professionals, uh, researchers, students, NGOs, uh, scientists, and uh, any documentary crews that want to have the opportunity to conduct field work in these far off places. Alex was awarded the 2017 Shark Guardian of the Year Award from the Shark Project, Project uh, of Germany. It was, it's an international award that was voted on by researchers and organizations from around the world. The equation is simple to him. Save sharks, save our oceans, save life. And with that, I'm very proud to introduce Dr. Alex Antonio. Sorry for the rough start there. But he'll pick it up. Wow. Uh, wow, you made it sound like I did an awful, I've done an awful lot of stuff there, Pat. <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate that, the, everyone's kind words. Um, you know, we do have a history with DiVentures. I have a history with DiVentures since the beginning of, of Fins Attached. You know, we've done a, a Guadalupe trip, we've done a Cocos trip together. 
Um, and um, in fact, DiVentures was one of our early sponsors and through the sponsorship of uh, DiVentures in the early days, uh, we were able to acquire a, a VR100 um, um, portable receiver, which we used to manually track tagged sharks uh, as they swim around, at, you know, the various uh, sites that we that we visit. So I've been thankful uh, for DiVentures from those early days, and you know, and it's it was it's always been a pleasure. So just so you know, at, for everyone listening there, I know not everyone's from Nebraska, but I am a corn husker at heart. Since I since I went to school in Lincoln, Nebraska, that's where I got my master's degree. Um, so so I am still a corn husker. Uh, for all of the Nebraska people that are tuned into this. So, so I do want to put out a shout to Dive Ventures and Dean and those guys to, for their support over the years and still have our logo on your website as a supporter. So appreciate, appreciate that. So, you know, when it comes to sharks and the state of our oceans, you know, if I, if I think about the current, if, if all I do is think about the current status in the current state of our oceans, you know, it's quite easy for me to get depressed about it and, and to fall into despair and to think about what are we doing to our oceans? What are we doing to sharks? We're just destroying things in such rapid, rapid fire that, you know, what, what's, what's it going to look like in the future? You know, so, so it's, and what's it all for? You know, that's the thing, you know, why are we doing all of this? And, and I just wonder and scratch my head at times and think, you know, why are we doing certain things the way that we're doing them, right? So, you know, I'd, li I'd like to think of, and, and like everyone now, to imagine with me a more positive future, right? And think about what would it look like if we were to succeed in our endeavors to enact greater protection and conservation efforts around the world. And I'm thinking of shark populations that are now thriving and sustainable. I'm thinking about oceans thriving and less pollution and more vibrant marine environments. You know, that's the future that I like to imagine. And I hope that you can all imagine that with me. But right now we're faced with a lot of challenges. And so when you, when you look at, uh, when you think about what's going on and what's driving the decline in shark populations, it's what you're seeing right now. So this is, I shot this video in Hong Kong a few years ago now, um, and it's in the kitchen of one of the restaurants and, shark fin alley in, in Hong Kong. And, and this is a, the preparation, the final preparation for a bowl of shark fin soup. And what he's doing, it's a thickening agent, but the flavor is chicken stock. And when they have that thickened chicken stock broth, they pour it over the pre-prepared shark fins that you'll see the, the gelatinous structure in the bowl. That's shark fin, flavored by chicken stock because, you know, we all know that shark fins have no taste and have no nutritional value. So that bowl right there that you see that finished product that's sold in that restaurant for about 60 US dollars. Right. So this is what is driving the decline, the 80, 90 plus percent decline in the major pelagic shark species, whether it's hammerheads, scalloped hammerheads, silkies, threshers, that's what's driving the, uh, the fishing activities. And then, you know, we always think of, you know, people like to throw out that number 80 million, 100 million. Now I'm hearing 150 million sharks killed every year. And I'm saying to myself, I can't even imagine that. What, what is 100 million? If I was to stack 100 million sharks on top of you, what would that even look like? Can you, can anyone in, listening to this, even wrap your head around that? I, I know I can't, I, I struggle with it. So this was uh, on that same trip that I filmed that 
bowl of shark fin soup being made. This was a fresh delivery. These are 50 kilo bags. Let me just turn the uh, audio off. So these are 50 kilo bags, which uh, 50 times 2.2 gives you the pounds, right? But, <laughs> Uh, so 50 kilos or 100, 100 plus pounds of uh, dried shark fins in each of these bags. And when I did the math, it took over a thousand dead sharks to fill one of these 50 kilo bags. So there, there were about 100 bags on the sidewalk. And then I followed this guy to film where he was putting them in the warehouse. And when, you, when, I when we turn the corner and I pan into the warehouse, you'll see the enormity of the, of the issue that we're facing. Look at all those bags besides what was on the sidewalk. And it's just, well, now I have a better understanding of what it is about what millions of sharks would look like. But it's not just the fins. You know, sharks are under pressure and the demand for shark products goes way beyond the fins now. And now we're finding shark products in cosmetics, in pet foods. Um, you know, the skins are being used for shoes and bags. So the, the ongoing pressure of sharks is constant. And in some places, increasing in demand. So what I'd like to suggest to people here in the audience and think about this because this is a personal decision that you have to make is I want you to think about what is the one thing that you can do in your life that could have a positive effect on the survival of either sharks or the marine environment in general. And it's a personal decision, a personal choice that you have to make. I can't make it for you. I've made lots of decisions for myself. You know, when I first started embarking in the shark research and conservation world. Um, but, you know, don't think that your one thing won't have an impact, because it will. So Fins Attached over the years has been uh, involved in research, conservation, but also advocacy. Right? I don't I don't think, I don't consider ourselves as an activist organization. We're not an activist organization. There's, you know, Sea Shepherd is an activist organization. Uh, Greenpeace is an activist organization. We're, we're more of an, an advocacy organization where we advocate for the conservation of sharks and the marine environment. Because if you go to governments with the heavy hand of an activist, they, it kind of backs them into the corner and you're, you're less likely, in my opinion, you're less likely to get cooperation from them. You know, Sea Shepherd has had their run-ins with different countries over the years, including Costa Rica, where they have been kicked out of certain countries, not allowed to be in there because of their, their activist approach. Now, you know, there's a time and place for the activist approach as well. But for us, we're more about the advocacy. So here you see, we were part of the uh, Silky Shark campaign uh, advocating for their uh, inclusion of Appendix 2 of CITES um, back in um, at the CITES meeting in Johannesburg, which is about three years ago now. So we were a part of a number of NGOs, nonprofit organizations that were involved in that campaign. We were a part of the um, Species Survival Network. So not only for the silky shark for, for CITES, uh, but also for the thresher sharks at the same convention and also for the, the mantas, the mobile mantas. So we were all part of that camp, those campaigns. And, and it, the good news is that all three species and subspecies um, actually passed and got listed on Appendix 2 of CITES. And the more recent CITES, um, which was in... Uh, it was supposed to be in Sri Lanka, but then it got canceled because of a terrorist bombing and it got moved to uh, Switzerland. Um, and um, the uh, blue sharks got listed on Appendix 2 at that one. 
So what's next for us uh, moving forward? We have lots of campaigns that we're moving forward with, you know, just to give a shout to um, our um, international Pos policy director, which is Randall Arauz from Costa Rica. So he's been uh, the official uh, policy director for us since, uh, since really since we acquired Sharkwater, the vessel. So, and if you don't know anything about uh, Randall, I, I recommend you Google him. Um, you know, he's more, he leans more on, on the activist side of things. He's had numerous run-ins with his own government, suing his own government at Costa Rica to enforce the laws that they have on their books. He was instrumental in shutting down private docks in Costa Rica, which basically shut down the Taiwanese longliner operation in Costa Rica. Uh, so, um, you know, Randall continues to, to be a, play a key uh, role for the uh, advocacy work for, Coast, for, for Fins Attached. This was another campaign that we were involved in uh, we were a one, you'll see our logo near the top there. We were one of a number of NGOs that basically um, wrote a letter to the uh, MSC Marine Stewardship Council because they were giving, um, they were putting their stamp of uh, on sustainable seafood. And, and in some cases, um, it was contrary to what they were stamp, putting their stamp on, right? So, so a classic example, right? So they, they have a, a sustainable fishery, and let's say for argument's sake, it was swordfish. So you have a sustainable swordfish fishery, which is long line, but you have a significant bycatch. And the most significant bycatch of a long line fishery, if you're targeting tuna, if you're targeting swordfish, guess what you're gonna catch more of? You're going to catch more sharks, the so-called non-targeted species, than, than you will the targeted species. You're also going to catch sea turtles, which are globally protected. It's illegal to trade in sea turtles. So how can you have a sustainable fishery that has a significant bycatch of endanger, other endangered species? So this was this is still an ongoing campaign and the last we heard was that um, MSC is changing their policies so that they will not give their stamp of approval of a sustainable fishery if they have bycatch of other unsustainable marine endangered marine life. Um, so that's this is still ongoing. But the biggest thing that we have to focus on right now is what is going to lead and ultimately ensure the survival of sharks. Now, there's a lot of scientists out there. There's a lot of research going on. We're, not, we're just one of hundreds of organizations and scientists that are currently uh, conducting research on sharks, right? So there's lots of data being collected. There's lots of publications going out there and we're part of that. You know, we, we have our name on, on more and more publications coming out. Um, you know, we published our data on the hammerhead tagging at Cocos that we've been doing for the last 10 years. So we've been doing all of this, but to be honest with you, no amount of research, no amount of data is gonna end up saving sharks from becoming extinct if that data is not used to change international policy. A publication is not gonna save sharks from becoming extinct. One more tagged shark, a hundred more tagged sharks is not gonna prevent them from becoming extinct unless we use that data to show what's going on with the migrations, the populations, the habitat use, if we don't use that information to convince governments to change international policy, then it's all for naught. I don't care about getting my name on a publication, to be honest with you, that's not what I'm in this for. Uh, I have, my name's on very few publications and, and I'm okay with that. I'll let the scientists have their names on publications, but we need to use that information 
to convince governments to enact policy changes. And not only individual governments, to, but to get these governments to work together to have cooperative into policy changes, right? So, and that'll become evident as I go through my presentation here, why it has to be country cooperation. Uh, this was the, uh, the campaign or the uh, position statement that we sent that I think uh, Pat mentioned this in my intro. This was what we sent to NOAA for our position for NOAA to, uh, to com help convince NOAA to put oceanic white tips on the uh, US endangered species list. Oceanic white tips in the Atlantic Ocean, the last estimate we heard was that the population is depleted by about 99%. That's near extinction. In the, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, it is already biologically extinct. And the difference between extinction, extinct and biologically extinct is that while biologically extinct means you still have a few of them left, there's not enough of them for the species to rebound. All right? These are, when you talk about species like the oceanic white tip, they're highly migratory, they're open ocean, solitary animals. The chances of a male meeting a female <laughs> in the vastness of the ocean greatly reduces as the population declines. And so when their population goes down, where their chances are next to zero, then that's where it, we say it's biologically extinct. So even if there was a moratorium, can't catch any more, chances are that species is not gonna come back. So here's, you know, publications and Fins Attached is a, is a co-authored uh, with, Mar in this case with uh, Mauricio, uh, here's, here's one that I had my name on. This was part of our work at Guadalupe and uh, looking at the movements of juvenile uh, and adult white sharks. And this was a groundbreaking publication because uh, for the longest time, um, there, the scientists thought that you only see adults at Guadalupe and, and you only see them there from like July until December. And our data and research show that it's not just adults, but you also have juveniles, uh, sub-adults, but you have sharks at Guadalupe 12 months of the year. So, the, the, so this was a really groundbreaking publication for us that uh, refuted uh, previously thought hypotheses as far as white sharks at Guadalupe are concerned. The next phase for us when it comes to um, to Guadalupe. Um, uh, can you see my uh, mouse moving around on the screen here? No? No. no. Okay, never mind. But it's clearly labeled. You'll see Guadalupe on the left side of the, of the image there, uh, Guadalupe Island. Um, and then the area in the, in the square there is, that's Vizcayano Bay. And then the bigger island off that elbow piece is Cedros Island. And then that little speck of an island west of Cedros is San Benito. So um, Vizcayano Bay area is already an identified white shark nursery. We know that for a fact. And um, three years ago, Mauricio tagged, I believe it was about 16 juvenile baby white sharks. And when we talk about juvenile baby white sharks, we're talking about sharks that are less than five feet in size, right? So they're small white sharks. Um, and um, he tagged uh, six of them with transmitters. And he also got tissue samples from those. And when they compared the tissue samples of the juveniles in that Vizcayano Bay to the adults of Guadalupe, there was no match. The parents for those babies did not come from Guadalupe. So it begs the question, well, where did those parents come from? Well, we know that white sharks are at Cedros. So we're excited to be start embark on a new research project this year, November, December. So we'll be taking shark water 
to Cedros and San Benito, and we're going to de be deploying uh, receivers. We're going to be tagging white sharks. We're going to uh, use an ROV to de do some deep water exploration. So we're really excited about uh, this new project area for us for white sharks uh, that we'll be doing in November, December of this year. So some of, and some of those will be uh, citizen scientist based kind of expeditions. So uh, if anyone's interested in exploring a new area, it's, it's, it's really exciting, new area for white sharks, this is, this is the perfect opportunity to do that. Here's a closer look at that whole region, right? And you'll see here where um, those X's and plus signs and circles around Cedrus Islands, those are white shark detections from white sharks that we've tagged at, uh, in, in the Vizcayano Bay area. So you'll see that uh, um, we know that white sharks are there. And the reason is, is there's two species of pinnipeds, sea lions at Isla Cedros. So that's why the white sharks are attracted to that. And then that little island west of Cedros, that's San Benito, and there's a kelp forest there. So we're also going to be exploring the kelp forests around San Benito. So people say, you know, how do you tag white sharks? I always say to them very carefully. <laughs> um, so here's a, here's a video. showing how we tag a white shark. So you bring it close to the boat using bait. And this was, uh, this was one of the juveniles that we tagged at Guadalupe. And you'll see this one was tagged with a uh, pop-up archival satellite tag. So that's part of what our Mexico research is all about. Beyond Guadalupe, we have, I know this is complicated, so please don't, don't drive yourself crazy trying to understand this, this poster here. I'll, I'll point out some uh, specific reason, but this is uh, Revilla Quejedo, uh, otherwise known as Socorro. So when you look at, in the middle there, you'll see Baja Sur, that's Baja California. So you can just see where Cabo San Lucas is at the top of that central image on this poster. And then you go south and you go to Socorro, you have San, Benito, uh, San Benedicto, you have Roca Patida, and then the furthest west island is um, Clarion. And our research, this is, this is where a perfect example of where research and data was used to convince a government to expand protection for sharks in their area. So when you look at the red square around all four islands, right, prior to this data being submitted to the Mexican government, and Fins Attached was a part of this, you'll see Mauricio, Peter Klimley as authors on this publication, but it was the data that we contributed to that showed sharks movements between the four islands that told the government before this, there was just a little bit of protection around each of the individual four islands. But we demonstrated that sharks migrated from one island to the other. So the adult silver tips at Roca Patida and the adult uh, uh, Galapagos sharks, they would go to San Benedicto and Socorro to give birth. So the nurseries for those species were at the other islands. So how can you just have protection around the individual islands and allow the fishermen to catch them as they were migrating from island to island. So this, this data convinced the government that they needed to expand the MPA, Marine Protected Area. So now that red square is the new, all-encompassing MPA, Marine Protected Area, around all four islands. So there, that's a no-catch zone. So sharks are completely protected in that red square area. So now, sharks have afforded some protection, major protection going as they migrate from island to island within the Revilla Quejero Archipelago, the national park area. So this was a, per, and this by the way, made it the largest marine protected area in North America. 
So this was really exciting, exciting work uh, that uh, led to the expansion and protection of, uh, of sharks. Um, this is uh, so this is what shark populations used to look like, and it's very rare to see this kind of shark aggregation anymore. So that was a school of silky sharks. Here's the hammerheads at Cocos Island. Here's a school of hammerheads at Cocos Island. Um, and it's becoming more of a rarity to see these kinds of aggregations for, you know, and this is what we're fighting for. We want it to get back to this. So um, as we transition through uh, conducting our studies from Mexico, now, now as we move forward to um, Costa Rica, so this is Cocos Island, Costa Rica. Let me show you this video. Oops. If I can uh, start it. I'm not sure why it's going blank. Uh, sorry about that, that didn't play. So we'll go on, you know, it was just showing you some the uh, activities of hammerheads and that was from two years ago. This is, a, this is a footage that we shot last year and at the beginning of October at Cocos Island. Uh, what's, what's really a transition, Cocos has gone through a transition. While we still see the hammerheads there and we still have Galapagos sharks and silky sharks, what we've seen more and more now are tiger sharks. So the, the tiger sharks have made a significant return since about 2008, 2009, the tiger shark population at Cocos Island has made a pretty remarkable recovery. And, and, and we, we have some theories as to why that, that may be the case. Uh, we're seeing less and less longliners, artisanal longliners going to Cocos Island. Um, where um, the National Park people did a better job enforcing the uh, what is now the 12 mile zone around Cocos that's a protection. Um, so we're doing more and more research on tiger sharks at Cocos. What is this? <laughs> Let's try this again. There we go. Okay, so this is how you tag a, a tiger shark underwater using a pole spear. You swim up to it and plant the tag right below the dorsal fin, and off that tiger shark goes. So, the work at Cocos Island is part of the larger project in the whole Eastern Tropical Pacific seascape, right? So here to point out to you, there are four main countries involved in this Eastern Tropical Pacific seascape, right? So you have Costa Rica, and you'll see that blue area around Cocos Island. Then you have the larger blue area around the Galapagos Island. Then you have, uh, which is Ecuador, then you have Malpelo, which is off the uh, Colombian coast, the Colombia Island. And then you have Coiba, which is uh, uh, Panama. So the four countries that are involved, and this is where it becomes critically important for those four countries to start collaborating. And there is some cooperative agreements right now in place between Costa Rica and Ecuador. And soon we're gonna get uh, Colombia involved in that cooperative agreement because our data is showing and coming up in a couple of slides, I'll show you how our data is now showing movements of sharks between those four regions. So it's no longer enough to just protect the sharks around Cocos or around Galapagos or around Mapello or around uh, Coiba. There has to be cooperative agreement between those four countries to offer some protection as the sharks migrate from island to island. 
But more specifically, uh, we, we demonstrated uh, through our data, all the work that we did around Cocos Island, how sharks utilize Cocos Island, but then we also show how some sharks, and you'll see in this graph, you'll see on this southwest corner, Galapagos, going east, Malpelo, and you'll see that there were some sharks that were tagged at Malpelo that migrated to Cocos Island. There were some sharks that were tagged at Galapagos that made it to Cocos. There were sharks that we tagged at Cocos that were detected in the Galapagos Islands. So our data is, is showing more and more um, that uh, sharks, it's the same population of sharks. And in this case, we're talking about scalloped hammerhead sharks as they migrate from uh, island to island. So specifically, part of our motivation or goal and objective is the, the green circle around Cocos, that's the current 12 mile protection. Right. Well, there are seamounts outside of that 12 mile protection. And you'll see in this uh, image right here, if you go south and a little bit west, you'll see Las Imelas, you see those two orange uh, dots there. Those, those are not islands, they're deep water seamounts. And Las Imelas, the, the top of the seamount is at about 180 meters. So that's about 600 feet in depth. But a couple of years ago, we deployed a receiver, a couple of receivers at Las Imelas, and hammerhead sharks that we tagged at Cocos were detected at those receivers at those sea, deep water seamounts. So now we're starting to get some data to show that the sharks are migrating outside of that 12 miles, going to these deep water seamounts, and then they're going back to Cocos. So the 12, and the fishermen know where these seamounts are. So it's no longer enough to have the protection around Cocos Island alone. So we, we are proposing to the Costa Rican government, see the big, the blue square, that that will convert about 2,000 square kilometers that is currently the MPA of Cocos to expand it to be about 50,000 square kilometers. And we had a, a, a bit of a setback <laughs> with that project because April and May of this year, we had expeditions planned to Malpelo and Coiba, and then a really big expedition from Cocos to Galapagos, and we were gonna be visiting those seamounts and tagging more sharks and, and following the swimway that the sharks take going from Cocos to Galapagos or Malpelo to, to Coiba. And obviously those expeditions had to be canceled uh, because of COVID. And, and so now that kind of set us back because that was the data that we were starting to put to get work going to start to put together to give to the Minister of Environment, who you see him here with me and Randall. Uh, that's the Minister of Environment in Costa Rica. And, and he has stated to us, he wants to make the legacy of the current president of Costa Rica. He wants to make part of his legacy, the expansion of the MPA around Cocos to be at least 50,000 square kilometers to make it comparable to the MPA of the Galapagos Islands in size, as well as Malpelo. So, so that's our goal. So those expeditions have now been postponed until next year, because we can only go to those seamounts during dry season, otherwise the seas get too rough. So that's why they were specifically designed for April and May. So now we're trying to push them back a whole year to April and May of next year to continue to get that data. But Cocos Island in and of itself is a, is a remarkable uh, place. And so the footage that you're gonna see here, and hopefully it, it's kind of moving somewhat smoothly, but this is Cocos Island. And Cocos Island, which is a World Heritage Site, 
um, is, is a truly remarkable location. Uh, I know Pat's been there. I don't know if anyone else in the audience has been to Cocos Island, but we highly recommend. So we were there last year uh, with, uh, with sharp water vessel. And, and the main objective of this expedition was to put a camera tag on tiger sharks and camera tags you uh, apply them to the dorsal fin uh, and then you it records video point of view video as well as acceleration information depth temperature information and then the the tag after 24 or 48 hours comes off the the dorsal fin it, it's a spring-loaded mechanism and then it comes off and then you uh, retrieve the tag so so this is um, Cocos Island, and this was all from last year. And you'll see tiger sharks, you'll see hammerhead sharks. Um, it's, it's just, uh, this needs to be protected and it needs to be expanded. The marine, the, the biomass of the uh, marine environment around Cocos is arguably unmatched to any other place uh, on this planet. Um, and it's, uh, we have three expeditions planned there this year, <laughs> end of August, uh, in September, and then uh, in uh, end of September as well. And then believe it or not, we have a major expedition, which is a closed, it's a, uh, a, fil a film crew that's shooting a documentary for Disney Plus. Uh, and they're using us and they wanna highlight our research at Cocos. So we're, we're looking forward to that uh, expedition that's going to be in October. But there are three other expeditions uh, that divers, citizen scientists can join us on to uh, participate. Um, let me uh, show you. So here's uh, us catching a tiger shark. And here's the, the deployment of the uh, camera tag. You see the camera tag, spring-loaded mechanism, put on the on the uh, dorsal fin. Then you let the shark go, and there's a uh, a metal piece that dissolves off of that, and then it pops up, and you retrieve the camera tag to be able to uh, to download the data. So quite remarkable, really is. So here's some of the data that I was alluding to to show you um, how species migrate between Cocos, Galapagos, Malpelo, and even in some cases to the mainland of Ecuador and the mainland of uh, Panama as well. And beyond the eastern tropical Pacific seascape, which is this area right here, we're also now beginning to draw a picture of how sharks are migrating along the entire Eastern Pacific. So now our focus is not just in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, but it's now in the entire Eastern Pacific. So when you look at um, sharks and their migrations, you'll see silky shark, that island Clipperton uh, off there in the middle of nowhere, which is a French owned island, a, sh a silky shark tagged in the Galapagos migrated all the way to Clipperton Island, right? And it's just um, whale shark from Espiritu Santo migrated all the way from Baja, California and the Sea of Cortez, all the way down to Panama. Um, you know, so we're starting to, you know, whale sharks from Galapagos heading way out west there. Uh, so we're starting to get date, more and more data now of the movement of sharks along the entire Eastern Pacific. So this is what we need. And this is what I'm talking about because of these sharks being highly migratory, when they leave these MPAs in these individual countries, it makes them vulnerable. And so that's why all of these governments and, uh, and um, environmental agencies need to come together and cooperate for the protection, the long-term protection of these animals. So that's really our, our focus of work. And, you know, I, I have to talk about the research vessel that we have. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it, when, when 
Fins Attach started in 2010. Uh, you know, it was with the reason of furthering the mission of research, conservation, education, and advocacy work. Uh, but then in 2017, you know, I, saw, I started to see the writing on the wall and that if we didn't act more forcefully, if we didn't act uh, with greater urgency um, to collect the data needed to convert into changes in international policy, um, my, my thought was that it, it, in the not too distant future, it's gonna to be too late. So the biggest hurdle that scientists and researchers have is the resources to get out into the field to actually do the work. Prior to shark water, you know, we used to rent other people's boats <laughs> to get the work, to get out into the field to get, and you're limited. You're limited by funding, you're limited by the availability of boats. There's a lot of restrictions and limitations to that. So, so for, for me, um, to acquire shark water was a cr critical part of the puzzle to allow us to get out into the field 12 months of the year potentially to collect more data and, and, collect, and, and get more results to go to with these governments with. And so that's why um, I, I reached out to some friends of mine that had the same belief structure and were able to get the funding together to acquire this vessel that you see here. And, and it looks, you know, it looks rugged on the outside, but I think it has character. <laughs> um, it's, uh, and the history of it is, it used to be a Japanese fishing boat, right? So that's the heritage of this boat. It came from taking from the ocean to now being redeemed and given back to the ocean. And, and the name shark water came from, as Pat alluded to in his intro, uh, in honor of Rob Stewart, who literally gave his life trying to save sharks. And so um, in his honor, and he was a, a partner on this boat project before he died. I had partnered with Rob in 2016 and we were so super excited and, you know, about working together and on this, getting this boat. And then he had his tragic accident in, in, in January of 2017. And in fact, it was, he went missing four days before he was scheduled to come to Denver for us to make the joint announcement that we had partnered and we were going to be acquiring this research vessel between Rob and Team Sharkwater and Fins Attached. Um, so the, he went missing on the Tuesday. He was supposed to be in Colorado that Friday. So it was particularly emotional for, for me and for us here, um, as well as the rest of the world, uh, having lost Rob, such a staunch con you know, ocean conservationist. Um, so in his honor, we renamed the vessel to Sharkwater and we're continuing with his legacy. So, uh, you know, it looks rugged on the outside, but it's a very functional vessel, a range of seven and a half thousand nautical miles. Uh, but it was done up nicely inside for those that haven't seen the inside pictures, but here's, here's the master <laughs> suite inside. So it's not, not too shabby. You know, here's another cabin. Sorry. It's not, is this screen blank? Huh? No, that's too bad. I don't know why. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, here's a, uh, Here's the dive deck area. So it's a quite a nice spacious dive deck area, big camera table, outside meeting space, fully equipped for uh, uh, diving, including nitrox. Um, so it's, uh, you know, this is part of our refit work that we did when we first acquired the boat, converting this to be a functional dive deck area for us. Here's our galley with our kitchen crew who uh, serve up uh, quite delicious meals for everyone. You know, what 
when we when we uh, renamed the vessel to Sharkwater, Rob's parents, you see his mom there in the red uh, uh, blouse, uh, his, the dad on the left there with the blue jacket. That's his sister, Rob's sister in the middle there, Alexandra uh, Stewart. And, um, and that's me uh, breaking the ceremonial champagne bottle as we rechristened the boat to shark water. Um, we didn't pollute the ocean. It's actually not real, even real champagne. And the, and the bottle is in a mesh bag. So nothing, so you're not, you know, broken glass in the ocean there. So it all gets caught in that mesh bag. And what, uh, what was, uh, they didn't tell me, but Rob's parents, when they came down to Florida for the rechristening event, they brought a vial of Rob's ashes and sprinkled them over the bow of the boat. So it's kind of like uh, Rob is with us wherever we go, continuing his legacy. And, and I like to think that he's uh, looking at us wherever we go, doing our work for research conservation, patting us on the back saying, well done, good job, as we continue forward with the mission. Um, you know, I, I started off by, by talking about, you know, despair and discouragement when we, if all we think about is the current state of sharks in our oceans. And, you know, I, I, I truly believe that, um, you know, in some cases, in a lot of cases, we're fighting a battle of good versus evil. And, and there are people out there that use that, unfortunately, uh, greed, small-mindedness, petty, uh, jealousy, whatever label you want to put on it, uh, uh, of, of really what is destroying this planet. And when it comes to sharks and fisheries and shark fin soup and everything else, it's all about the money. It's all about the greed. Um, and um, so it, it really is a, a battle of good versus evil. And, you know, the Evil puts fear, despair, defeat, discouragement in your minds. Uh, but, you know, for us, these are no options. Good never says give up no matter what obstacles are put in your path. Good will always prevail. In our own hands lies the power to choose. What we want most to be, we are. And you can quote me on that. Because <laughs> I, I truly believe that, that that is what we're facing uh, in, in this day and age. So, you know, I would, and, and we feel discouraged, you know, you have the people on one shoulder whispering in your ear, you know, you're going to fail. What are you talking about? You know, you, you don't belong here. And unfortunately it, it starts to paralyze us and we have to listen to the good voice on the other shoulder. That's telling us to keep fighting no matter what obstacles are put in our effect in our pathway. We have, to, if we are knocked down, we have to get up and keep fighting because in the end i truly believe this that good will prevail over evil so what will it take to save the world we need to have the passion to care the strength to act and the vision to inspire and with that i will leave you and take any questions that you may have Dr. Antonio, thank you. That was intriguing and wonderful. I do have a couple of questions in the chat room. If anybody has additional questions, go ahead and type them now while we're talking. So the first comment I will say is that we have from Omaha, someone saying still one of my favorite dive trips was on the shark water. Thought I'd pass that on to you. Uh, so one of the questions, um, is it possible to transport some babies to the area where they are biologically extinct? Is that a possibility? Uh, that's a good question. Really haven't thought about that. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that if, if you're referring to the oceanic white tips, um, I'm, you know, we, we don't even know where their nurseries are. You know, they've never been witness to mates. They've never been witness to give birth. I mean, they're giving birth out in the open ocean is our theory, right? They're not coming to the coastal waters. Uh, to give birth, at least not, none that have been uh, identified. So, um, you know, but that, that would be an intriguing uh, question. Um, I'm trying to find the chat. Uh, 
Let me stop sharing. Should be, if you move your mouse, there should be able to open the chat window. On the very bottom for me, it says chat, and you can click on it. Oh, here, yeah, I got it now. Now I have to put my glasses on so I can read the chat. <laughs> well, I can, I can read you some of them. Um, so what about... Um, Actually, the first oh, question, Erica, the plan is that we will be at DEMA, assuming it doesn't get cancelled, by the way. Uh, the next one was, what is the process for tagging sharks? I think you answered that, that some of them are above water, some of them are below water. Yeah, so, um, is yeah, yeah, I can elaborate on that. The ones I showed was like tagging that tiger shark or the white shark while they're free swimming, right? Um, but in some instances, we do catch sharks. And our preferred method now is actually to catch a shark and implant the, the tag internally acoustic tags. Satellite tags have to be on the outside, um, but uh, acoustic tags uh, get tagged on the in, inside. So we like to catch them and do shark surgery and implant the tag inside because that way um, the shark doesn't shed the tag um, prematurely. And some of those tags can give us data for uh, as long as 10 years. Um, assuming, assuming the shark doesn't get caught <laughs> by fisheries and uh, but um, the external ones, you know, invariably come off uh, prematurely. It could be a, another, you know, if it's flapping on the side of the shark there, another, it could be a, an attractive nuisance for another species to come and bite it thinking it's a, it's another fish or something. And then they, they pull it off or it just gets pushed out uh, depending on how it's implanted. So external and internal. Yeah, uh, one of them toward the bottom. Where can we learn about trip opportunities on shark water with Alex and the crew? You've talked about some of them. People some of those, join. if you go to our website, we have an expedition page uh, and we have some of the expeditions in Costa Rica. We'll be posting the Cedro stuff here pretty soon as well. And then posting for next year. Uh, we haven't posted anything for 2021. We're, we're trying to survive through 2020 right now, but in the next, in the coming month or so, uh, we'll be able to post uh, our plan for 2021 as well. That, that was a good question there uh, by Pat, uh, connected uh, connection to the Farallons. You know, in the early days of research at Guadalupe and at the Farallons, those scientists tagging sharks at the Farallons um, and the scientists uh, tagging sharks at uh, Guadalupe, we found no crossover, no sharks tagged at Guadalupe got detected at the Farallons and no Farallon tagged sharks got detected at Guadalupe, but there was a meeting place, uh, the White Shark Cafe, where sharks tagged in those two areas would, would meet up. But now in the, in the more recent years, we have started to get detections of white shark, Farallon tagged sharks at Guadalupe and Guadalupe tagged sharks at the Farallons. And, and it's up to about 20 sharks now that have made that crossover. So we're, we're beginning to think, you know, in the early days, we thought they were separate populations, but now we're beginning to think that it's the same population of white sharks. So, so that's a good question. Uh, right at the bottom, how do you tell the age of a shark? Oh, um, yeah, the, the, mo the most definitive way is to um, to get a vertebra from the spine. <laughs> it's kind of like tree growth. You have different ring, you know, so that's, but obviously that's a pretty invasive way. You can do that from, you know, dead specimens. Uh, you know, if you can get, get them at the fish markets when they get landed and, and they get cut up and you can take uh, samples of the vertebra and really uh, uh, age the sharks that way. In fact, that's what they used uh, for the Greenland shark, and they uh, they determined that the age of Greenland sharks was like hundreds of years, like three hundred year old sharks, kind of thing, you know. Um, so that's the that's the most way. Tip typically, um, uh, the rule of thumb is that sharks reach sexual maturity at about a third of their lifespan. So um, if you think a white shark, which we uh, think lives to be about 60 years old. 
so at age uh, 20 um, is when it becomes sexually mature. So you look at the, if it's a male, you look at the claspers and if they're, if they're calcified, which means they mature and they're being used, um, you know, but it's, uh, it's hard to make that determination. So, uh, you, you know, you get growth rates too, right? So if we recapture sharks that we previously tagged, so if we cap, if we caught a, um, a one meter shark, uh, a baby, a silver tip, Galapagos, and, and we, we think it's, uh, about a year old and we recapture it and we look at the growth rate uh, the next year, the next five years, then we can kind of estimate uh, age that way as well. Uh, you see the next question is, why does it take so long to reach maturity? Yeah, that's just the, bio, the biological nature of, uh, of sharks, which it's a great question. Uh, and that's part of the shark's demise, right? That's, that's part of the, the reason why shark populations are, are declining. Uh, they're, they're slow growing, late to mature, uh, and then when they do mature, they give birth to um, very few pups once a year, once every two years. You know, the thresher shark typically gives birth to two pups once a year or once every other year. Right? And when they're commercially being harvested or caught, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they can't keep up with the, that kind of fishing demand because they just cannot reproduce fast enough, you know. But, you know, when you're talking about the apex predator, you know, the apex predator in a natural environment left to nature, you don't need that many of them for the survival of the species. It's what's referred to as the case strategy of reproduction. Right, for apex predators. So when, when you don't, because you can't have too many apex predators, otherwise everything else starts to disappear, right? So, so but in a normal world, you only need that, you know, a, a relatively small number for the survival of the species. And then, but then man came into the picture and started harvesting them at commercial rates. And so now that's why the populations have declined 80, 90 plus percent, um, and some species uh, on the verge of extinction. Uh, and that's because of their late to mature, late for sexual maturity, uh, you know, a few, a handful of pups once a year, once every two years, long gestation periods. And, and that's part of their demise, I'm afraid. Yeah. I have one more question that was sent privately. Uh, this might be regional, but is there a shark that you are most concerned about in its uh, numbers? Well, yeah, you know, we touched on the oceanic white tip, which is obviously in dire straits in the Atlantic 99 or on the verge of becoming uh, biologically extinct in the entire Atlantic. Uh, we're really also concerned about the scalloped hammerhead sharks in the uh, Eastern Pacific, where the populations are, are now, the estimate is that declined at around 90 plus percent because the uh, scalloped hammerhead fins are a favorite for shark fin soup. Uh, and even though, you know, there's some protection for them, they're supposed to be listed on Appendix 2. Well, they are listed on it, not supposed to be, but they are listed on Appendix 2 but it's not having a, uh, a significant impact on the survival of the scalloped hammerheads and they're still being caught unabated. The fins are still being exported uh, to Asia. You may have seen recently in the news about the 28, 24 tons, 26, uh, 26 tons of dried shark fins that were seized in Hong Kong uh, a, a few weeks ago and they originated out of Ecuador. And the species of fins were identified as um, silkies, threshers, and scalloped hammerheads. Uh, and all three species are listed on Appendix 2 of CITES. So that goes to show that CITES is, Appendix 2 listing is an ineffective means for the protection of these animals. Not to bore you with um, uh, the, the the 
policies, but Appendix 2 means you can still trade, but you have to show that the amount being traded is not detrimental to the species. So when you export, it's all about international commerce. That's what CITES is all about. So when you export fins of an Appendix 2 listed animal, it's supposed to be accompanied by a scientific study, what they refer to as a non-detrimental non finding scientific report. So the amount being exported is not, not detrimental to the survival of the species. Well, you know, that's not foolproof. And, and a lot of times the importing countries don't even bother to look for that not detrimental finding report. Uh, so, so the bottom line is CITES Appendix 2 listing is not an effective mechanism to save these animals from becoming extinct. So Randall and I are now, we're trying to drum up support from other nonprofits, other non, other organizations to push for the Appendix 1 listing of hammerhead sharks. And that's where turtles go. You know, it worked for sea turtles. Sea turtles were, were uh, endangered until they got listed on Appendix 1 um, uh, a number of years ago, and now the, the populations are coming, have come back, and, and a lot of them are, you know, their survival is ensured right now. Green turtles, hawksbills, loggerheads, you name it. The only one that's still struggling is leatherbacks, but that's for another reason. Um, so Appendix 1 listing for hammerhead means you don't have to worry about non-detrimental findings. The Appendix 1 listing means you're not allowed to have any international commerce in that species. You, know, you can have local consumption, but locals, you know, the, the, amount, the fins being um, used locally is, is not significant enough to worry about it. But if we can put a shut, if we can close down the international commerce of, uh, of these sharks and starting with the hammerhead, and then that's the, the right move to go into. And to our surprise, well, maybe not to our surprise, but there are those nonprofits, conservation organizations that are against and would not support an Appendix 1 listing of hammerhead sharks because their rationale is, well, if we put them on Appendix 1, it's going to jeopardize putting other sharks on Appendix 2. And we're saying, what difference does it make? Appendix 2 doesn't it's not worth anything anyway. It's not, it's not effective. Let's go for appendix one. Come on, grow some, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and, and let's have a backbone and, and fight for what you, what you, unless you don't believe it's right, you know, but we think it is right. And that's what we need to fight for. Right. Well, I have one more, a little bit lighthearted question. How many teeth? On average, does a shark go through in their lifetime? Um, good question. You know, you'll see, you'll hear people out there talk about 30,000 teeth. You know, they have the five, six rows of teeth, like conveyor belt of teeth, right? So as they fall out, um, the, the next one pops in, you know. I, I had this discussion with Dr. Clinley, AKA Dr. Hammerhead, just, just last, last week, in fact. Um, and we were talking about that because I always used to think oh, I've read in the literature it's at 30,000 teeth. And he says, well, you're not, I'm not sure you can claim that. We really don't know. But, you know, we do know it's thousands. But 30,000, I'm not sure. But it is thousands of teeth uh, that they do go through throughout their lifespan uh, if they die of old age. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Antonio, I learned a lot tonight. This was very intriguing, very interesting, and I'm uh, excited and, and um, uh, motivated to do some changes like you talked about earlier. So thank you very much for your time tonight. I'd love to love to uh, do more with DiVentures. If we could uh, get a DiVentures-sponsored uh, citizen scientist research expedition. Uh, I know Pat would love to do that. Um, then uh, you know we should do that, whether it's uh, Mexico or whether it's uh, uh, Costa Rica. We do gr the coastal Costa Rica expeditions are incredible experiences, but also Cocos Island or even Malpelo. You know we've done a couple of uh, 
citizen scientist trips to Malpelo, uh, not last year, the year before last. And, uh, you know, that's another uh, one of those World Heritage sites. So, and now, especially with the focus on these swimways, right? I don't know if you read recently or saw the news that Sylvia Earle and Mission Blue declared the Cocos de Galapagos shark swimway as one of uh, one of the blue mission blue hope spots mm -hmm. absolutely i well, appreciate it really yeah thank appreciate you so everyone. much thank you so much uh, for uh being a part of this as uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to people uh, about sharks um you know i it, it has been my passion for over 25 years a lot of sweat blood and tears have gone into this but you know you know it's a passion when you eat sleep dream about you know, this particular you know what your passion is all about and 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 especially when you do it for no money for 25 years then you know <laughs> you really know it's your passion when you when you do it for that long of a time for for no uh monetary gain so uh so i'm, I'm you know I, I i get inspired by people um when they uh uh when they have the passion as well and getting more involved with the youth as well so it's uh you guys people like you inspire me and i hope i've inspired you a little bit as well uh during this presentation and i appreciate your time Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Antonio. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you all soon. Stay safe. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.